Today, we have Lane Kawaoka from Simple Passive Cash Flow to discuss mindsets as they relate to real estate. Welcome to Richer Soul, your journey to a more purposeful, intentional, amazing life. Where are you going to go and how are you going to get there? Let's figure that out together. At the core is the financial well-being to be able to do what you want, when you want, how you want. It's about personal freedom and abundance. If you have questions or comments for me, please reach out. I would love to hear from you. You can email me. It's rocky at richersoul.com. I would also like to hear suggestions for topics and guests for the show. Today, we're going to talk about abundance and mindsets, especially as they relate to real estate. Let's meet our guest. Today, we have Lane Kawaoka from Simple Passive Cash Flow to talk about real estate. Welcome to Richer Soul, Lane. Hey, Rocky. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here. Lane, can you just share a little bit about where you're at in your journey with my audience? So I am currently 31 years old. I um, followed the linear life up pretty much up to a few years back. I uh, went to college at University of Washington for industrial engineering, graduated in four years and went straight to work for a transportation company where I was their engineer and construction supervisor. And I traveled the United States work in 60, 80 hours, 100% travel. At the time I graduated in 2000, back in 2007, it was a good job back then, you know, 2008 happened and, you know, I had a stable job. It allowed me to save a lot of money because I wasn't living anywhere. I was traveling so much. I got rid of the home li living. So for about four or five years, I was living out of suitcases and that, was what my secret to uh, saving money and eventually investing with it. Wow, that's impressive. Coming out, you find a job that costs you very little, and so you're able to create a big chunk of change. Did you do it all in 401ks, or did you do it outside of there as well? I've always been taught to save my first job picking pineapples. I made $2,500. And I remember putting $1,500 into a Roth IRA account. That was way, way, way back, way long before I even graduated college. When I started working, at least 6%, you know, there was a match at that time, went into the 401k. And I think I heard the idea from some laborer to put all your money, you know, 25% into the 401k which was fine at the time, you know, you single, so, and you don't really have too many expenses. So it's not too hard to do that. You know, making decent money, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 out of college. So I had the money to do that. And then the intention was, Hey, you, with this 401k, you can take a loan on it, pay yourself interest. And it's like, okay, I don't, you know, I don't know, really know how that really works, but it sounds cool to pay myself interest instead of somebody else. The goal at that time was, hey, save your money to buy a primary residence to live in because that's what everybody told you to do. And I've been listening to everybody go to college, study hard for my whole life up to the point. So I just kind of followed that linear path. And what changed then? I finally saved enough money to buy the first home in 2009. It was a class A property, you know, a very nice property. It um, was pretty nice and pretty big for me. And it was a little bit too much home, especially when I'm home only on Saturday evening from traveling the whole week. I realized that, you know, I was all that up to that point, you know, I was very cheap. I mean, Miller next door, you know, I was definitely going to be the poster boy for that. 
I mean, on my website, I have this kind of fun little list of like just the cheap ass things I would do. <laughs> just the most ridiculous things like washing your car in the rain or, you know, I mean, some of those things I don't do because quite frankly, a lot of those are a little outlandish on that list on my website, but just like the very like saver mentality, scarcity mode. I was just like living with all these um, you know, insecurities about money because, you know, money doesn't grow in trees is what I've been taught. And like how everybody's taught, it's a good uh, practice, but at some point it becomes a self-limiting um, mindset. So I, um, you know, I had this money and I bought the house and then I realized that, hey, you know, what if I'm not here? I'm not optimizing the use of this asset. What happens if I just rent it out? Because, you know, I'm an engineer and I'm kind of the questioner type. So I just kind of question things. And I called up one of my old landlords and, you know, I just said, hey, I rented from you at one time. Can we talk about this? And, you know, she came over and we worked up an agreement. And then in a couple of weeks, she put the ad out and it rented pretty quickly. And it rented for like $2,200 a month. And I was like, well, my mortgage is only like $1,600. You're telling me I'm making what, 500 bucks every month, even after paying you? This is crazy, right? <laughs> like, and that's what started this uh, feeding frenzy of podcasts and books. You know, and then I read The Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then I was hooked. <laughs> Sometimes we need that little spark to ignite us and get us going. And once that happens and you go start going down that path, it, uh, it becomes impressive. And it sounds like you were lucky to have that happen to you at a young age, sending you down this path to be able to build, uh, in your case, real estate and be able to do that. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. And you know, I catch myself a lot because I try and get people to, you know, to do the same thing to get on the road to financial independence. But I realized how hard it is. I mean, I was an accidental landlord and I stumbled upon it on accident. And then I saw the, uh, then I saw how the uh, sausage was made and how the mousetrap worked. And then I was hooked. But yeah, you know, I mean, I'm not going to take any credit. I just stumbled upon it by accident. Sometimes that's why it's good to have accidents, right? Because right. the outcome of it can be a, a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah. And I look back on the whole, you know, that was a pretty bad job. I remember I, as the supervisor, I couldn't eat lunch because I got used to eating lunch super fast. So like, if you ever eat with me, I'm, in, I'm done with my food in like five minutes or even a couple minutes because there was this like sort of PTSD, you know, Blackberries were really big back then, you know, very conservative company too. And I, I hated it. It was horrible. You go to a meeting and you can't talk unless you sit next to your supervisor and you can't talk unless your supervisor asks you to talk or you address your boss's boss. If it's two levels above you by Mr. So-and-so, you cannot address them by first name. It's just absurd, right? Like, I mean, this is this isn't too long ago. This is like 2012 or 11, you know, it's like not so long ago. It just kind of like made me put me uh, put a sour taste in my mouth that most people get when they're like 25, 30 years into their career. That was sort of the, uh, the motivation to there's got to be something else. There's got to be a different way of doing this. And again, stroke of luck learning that early on versus 20 years later. It gives you uh, a lot more time to build up and go forward. Right. The time is so, so important. <laughs> I know your website is called Simple Passive Cash Flow. Everyone talks about passive cash flow, but it actually takes work to create cash flow. It's not always so passive. I think what is good though is if you do a lot of the work up front then later on it becomes passive but you have to put a lot of time and effort into building it first right when you're buying passively cash flowing assets there's really not too much 
work doing to manage the manager and and you know even getting the the properties if you buy it from credible folks the work is really in the not getting the knowledge i mean i i look i read all these books and you know hundreds and i'd say thousands of hours of podcasts and you can go through a lot of podcasts when you're listening with that cool outcast app you know you can speed it up and compress the white space listen to that stuff at two and a half speed I mean, you can get through a lot of podcasts with that stuff and so that's a key for all people that i know that have been successful is they read and learn a ton i think that's an important thing i have a massive bookcase as well i listen to tons and tons of hours of podcasts every week and i'm always learning to look to different people to find out what their different experiences have been. So if I can learn from their mistakes and from their knowledge, then it saves me from having to do that. Right. It's almost like a different species of human being. (laughs) Listen to podcasts and don't. It is. And, you know, when you look at the demographics of it, though, people who listen to podcasts tend to be higher income earners more educated and it's it's just what people who are there do that's probably why it's the data behind the whole saying that um you know what do people do with their time right like you know i go to work every day as an engineer and after 12 hours of commuting and working you only have about a few hours and like, what are you going to do with it are you going to watch netflix or are you going to like feed your mind and build that based knowledge, invest in yourself. Talk about one way to create time. You use a virtual assistant. Can you explain what exactly is a virtual assistant? A virtual assistant is, if you think of like an admin assistant, a lot of managers at director levels, if their company is smart, to leverage their time, they will assign an administrative assistant to take care of some of the mundane tasks just to make life a little better because when you're a high leverage worker making a lot of decisions you know you got to get rid of the mundane things i subscribe to the david allen getting things done you want to automate things as much as possible so the virtual assistant is kind of your admin assistant but virtually since you know a lot of us we work in the computer all day long and everything is virtual these days but it's just thinking like, what can you outsource? What are the silly things that you're doing <laughs> every day? Just like money, you know, like what are the silly things you're wasting time? Are you driving down to the store to save a dollar when you could have just got on Amazon and just be done with it? I'm a big fan of Amazon. I've started to use them quite a bit for everything instead of leaving the house now. I really don't need it this minute. Two days is good enough. And so it saves me time. So how much does a virtual assistant cost? How expensive is this? The key is is the location of the virtual assistants. I have partnered with a startup in the Philippines. And there, I speculate that the the average salary is about a tenth to 20% of the United States. When we're paying them like five bucks an hour, I know at my job, I mean, for the first couple hours, I'm I'm working hard, but I tail off. It seems like these guys, they work hard eight hours a day. It's a different mentality and it's a different country. And when you don't have as much opportunity as we do, then you kind of have to do that. You have no choice. Yeah, but I, I like what this startup does. And that's kind of why I partner with them is, you know, like, you know, there's Manila, which is the main city in the Philippines, which is obviously a little more expensive than the rest of the country. Yeah, they go out and to some of the countryside and they get people who are willing to work for less because they're working from home, you know, out in the countryside and they don't really need the money that you need in Manila, much less the America <laughs> for that matter. So it's a very good, that's the key to their success is getting people who are wanting to create that lifestyle. It's kind of funny that, you know, we're, we're trying to create that lifestyle, but so are the virtual assistants somewhere in the Philippines. I don't know where, but you know, they want to work from home. 
and they just want a little money and they don't need that much money to survive down there. That's pretty cool. So I guess the concern though is how well do they communicate in English? Their English is actually pretty good. I know that there are other places you can get virtual assistants like Latin America or some of the Asian countries. Philippines are known for the best English. What I like about them is they're extremely polite. <laughs> they're, they address me with like all their emails are very like formal, even though it's like something like, Hey, I need, I need that login for that one website. I need that Google authentication code or whatever. Every email will be addressed very politely and it you know, makes me feel really important. <laughs> the hard part is that you need to be able to manage them effectively. And me personally, I have an industrial engineering degree, so I think in terms of systems and processes, but it's nothing that you can't replicate. A good model that I have or best practices is I like to use Google Documents, you know, use the Google Drive with spreadsheets and, uh, and docs and create instructions and have the virtual assistant edit those instructions to, so that they can better understand because you're going to have change order from time to time. Having better instructions, you know, step one, do this, step two, do this. Here's the URL for this spreadsheet. It's all about building the systems, you know, building the manual, how to, you know, build burgers, basically. So you put in a little bit of time up front and it gives you a lot of time back. The cost is very minimal. And so you're right, literally right. buying time for next to nothing. Right. You know, I do the, the simple passive cash flow podcasts and before it was taking me a couple hours to go through and edit them. Now that's all been outsourced. I have the intro, I have the ad in the middle, and I have the outro. And I was like, you know, that's taken me at least 20 minutes to put in myself. And more like five, 10 minutes. <laughs> Time is so valuable. You know, I'm like, well, maybe I'm going to type it in the instructions and see, let's see if they can do it. And sure enough, they did it. I still have the management oversight, the final call. Have places where you can check quality. And I do that in the middle. I go through the podcast and I final scrub everything. But at the end, posting it to every single social platform, that takes another hour. I can have them do things like do show notes. And I have this master spreadsheet with every single action item, every single guest and all the show notes on the spreadsheet. And that wouldn't be possible unless I had them do it. And it had to start somewhere. You know, I had to start the spreadsheet. I had to, you know, have instructions to do this and do that. Oh, well, I guess one thing that's been useful is I use this software called Viewed It. You just click a button on your, your laptop and it just records the screen and you've got a little you know, screencast right there and you can click the link right into your instructions and it makes things super clear. So you quickly train them and they can keep going back and looking at it. You do it once, you systematize it, and you turn it over. Honestly, that's what entrepreneurs do. They create a system and they perfect it. And then they plug people in and let them go do the work while they rake in all the money. Works right. Well. And you have them improve the processes and, and you're always making improvements. Absolutely. So on your journey, have you had mentors help you out at all? Initially, like I said, I was super cheap, very scarcity mindset. I didn't pay for anything. I was always the guy like, well, I'm going to go look at his real estate investing website and just devour the whole thing. I guess I know why. I mean, a lot of us grew up that way. Money doesn't grow in trees. I see mentorship as a lot of different things. And because I'm sort of becoming a mentor for real estate investing, I see uh, different ways about going about doing it. They call them like four levels of mentorship. The first is the unconscious mentor, which is like, you know, this is the stuff we read in the news. What are we reading? We're we reading newspapers or listening to CNN. I mean, first of all, I don't, I don't have time for that stuff and nor does it pertain to anything in my life really. What are the podcasts you're listening to? Are you listening to, you know, the good stuff that Rocky's putting out? 
or you listen to flipping podcasts or you listen to, you know, like passive investing podcasts, like simple passive cash flow, or are you just spending your time on Netflix or listening to some random podcast on Radio Lab or This American Life? It's all about niching down and to feeding your brain with the correct information. Because if not, there's all this noise out there. The whole Facebook feed is all noise. And you need to consciously pick what you want. Opt into your destiny and what you're going to be doing in the future, as opposed to having this stuff shoved down your throat, like how it is for most people. And they don't even realize. That's the first level. The second level is going out and finding a mentor, but more of an involuntary mentor. Because I know you're super busy, Rocky. So it's like if people came up to you and say, Hey, Rocky, can you be my mentor? Can you come up to me and teach me everything you know? I know you're a nice guy, but like, I mean, that's why you do the podcast to leverage yourself because your time is so valuable. First of all, people come up to you and they want this information. You know, maybe it's kind of a side topic, but you know, in life, there are givers and takers. And I choose to uh, work with people who have abundance mindset and like to give to others. And quite frankly, a lot of these people, I can tell right off the bat that they just take, take, and take. And I know those are the people to, that I really want to waste my time on. A lot of these people, they come up to you and they want, who's the best turnkey provider? Who do you use for property management? Who do you use your contractor? Do you get an LLC? Okay, thanks. Cool. Talk to you later. Bye. You know, it's like they just come up to you through the question chain that they're looking for that mentor. But I guess we'll probably talk about social capital here on the agenda. Like you've got to add value first. You get any input on there? You got a lot of people calling you. What's, what's the best way to get things from Rocky? Well, and that's the purpose of the podcast is to be able to put out information that is clear and defined. And that's what I did in the first nine episodes. I laid out the entire foundation. And the purpose with that was so that everyone can get the information and I only have to do it once. I put the time and effort into creating that. That took months to get that down. But once it was done, then I'm like, here's my stuff in a box. Go. And what the podcasts do then is bring live examples to that to show you in more depth how to do it. So for me, that's probably what the podcast does. It creates kind of that mentorship way that you can figure out which area you want help in and listen to those episodes. God, yeah, I, I do the same thing. I have like foundation podcasts and I tell people, yeah, just go listen to the first dozen and then let's have a conversation. I, I'm still in the realm of helping people one-on-one -on -one for free. As the podcast grows, it's, it's going to be kind of by the wayside. Getting back to the mentors, I think you need to find, there's going to be mentors out there who are sort of, they want you to succeed, yet they don't really believe you, quite honestly. And a lot of people, they come to me and I give them all the information they need, but that's the reason why most people are working and trading their time for money and not financially free because people don't make the decisions on their own. For me to spend all this time with them is like not very the best use of my time and money because I've created a platform where I can leverage myself and quite frankly, duplicate myself. So to spend some time with somebody who's not going to take action, it's just, you know, it just doesn't make sense. So I guess look for people who are willing to help you out along the way. But that highest level is, or that third level is to find a mentor who believes in you and they know your background. They know that your skill set is going to work in what you're looking to do and to get linked up with that person. I mean, at the very least, buy the dude lunch pay to play. You have to pay the guy to teach you what they know because it's, it's going to by far going to uh, reap the rewards. I mean, you can spend your, your hours and hours and hours learning this stuff, but you're still going to make mistakes. I mean, you don't know what you don't know. I mean, you know, I give them the turnkey providers. I give them all the good contacts. I give them all the property management companies, but then now they're idiots when they go to home purchasing 
process because they haven't built up this uh, BS detector, as I call it. And they just aren't sophisticated in terms of uh, figuring this stuff out. I mean, they'll never learn it. You'll never listen to enough podcasts or enough books. It's a difference between people who get it and people who don't. And part of it is experience. Because like I said, I didn't have this mindset initially. But I would would have, ever, if I would have done it, I would have paid a guy a few grand to like, hey, just walk me through this first due diligence process on my first property. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't even know what I'm missing. I don't even know. And you're just compressing time, which is the most important thing in compressing learning cycles. I guess here's the big thing. The fourth level of mentorship is once you've been mentored, 80% of mentors become mentors of their own and help other people do it and you know pass the wealth for us. I think that's, that's the cool part is when the circle gets completed. That's my big thing on mentors. Mentors are super important, Rocky. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think you mentioned some things. You've got to go through the process. You've got to take the steps and you've got to do the work. So if you're looking to go buy real estate, you don't show up at the mentor and say, teach me how to buy real estate. First, you go read the books. You listen to some podcasts. You get your bases down. So you have that basic understanding, basic vocabulary. Then you go into the mentor and you ask the more difficult questions. Hey, I learned this and I learned this and I see this, but I don't understand how these three things go together. Can you explain that to me? Then your mentor will look at you and go, yes, these fit together in this way. But don't ask them to start at the beginning. You've got to go do the work first get your basics down, and then go find people to ask those questions. And people who are highly successful are more than happy to share that knowledge with you if you've done your job and done your work first. And that's pretty much what you've talked about. Yeah, I think that's a great bottom-up approach. And I talk about bottom-up approaches and top-down approaches, and that's a great tip to take it from the top down, the mindset, I mean, kind of pull your head out of your butt. Here's this person who is killing it. They don't have too much time and you're taking time away from them. The biggest valuable resource of them all. Why should they help you? This is the difference between low social IQ and high social IQ. Have empathy. Know what other people want. How would you feel if some random came up to you and just started the question train, just trying to get, you know, take all this information and not give you anything in exchange, right? So always lead with adding value first. Absolutely. And we'll talk a little bit about social IQ in a minute. I want to talk about one other type of way of learning, and that's called a mastermind group. And I think you've created a, a real estate mastermind group. Can you tell us what exactly is a mastermind group? I think the deal got popularized in the Think and Grow Rich book by Napoleon Hill. I think a lot of the old presidents, like the Ben Franklins of the world, they all got together and they talked about their problems. One common format of a mastermind, how I run mine, is you get a group select of people, little different contrasting opinions and paths, but they're all high performers. So it's all a room of proven people. And you go around the room and, and they call this the hot seat. Each individual, whether it's 15 minutes or two hours, talks about their business and everybody offers opinions, it incites discussion, it's an interesting format. I try and keep my masterminds down to about eight people because, you know, any more it gets too much people, any less, you don't have that robust amount of knowledge base, but you can run things, these things all different ways. It's just a matter of having high qualified people and all in thinking the same way with the abundance mindset that, Hey, by give, helping other people, we're all going to get better. It's the mindset of by working together, we are going to succeed and everybody outside the group 
is at a disadvantage because they're not in the room here. Absolutely. And so going into a mastermind, I think you, you need to have a certain mindset. There's a Bible quote that I know that kind of sets that up, which is, as iron sharpens iron, one man sharpens another. The thing here is when you take iron and you go to sharpen it against other iron, it creates heat and sparks. And most people aren't willing to accept the sharpening. And that's what you've got to do. When you sit in that hot seat in the mastermind, you aren't there to say, oh, I don't agree with you. I don't think you're right. You're there to take the sharpening, Mm -hmm. to be told what you're missing, what you need to correct, and how you can correct it. And it's up to you to listen to the feedback and accept it, to accept that heat and that sharpening. And if you can't do that, you're never going to get that razor sharp edge that comes from sharpening. Yeah, I think you're totally right there, Rocky. One of my questions I ask on my podcast is, what is something that you recently changed your mind on? And the tagline there is, the ego gets in the way of greatness. And from what I see, the most unsuccessful people are some of the most like closed-minded people you will meet. Some of the people that I meet at some of these higher-level investing groups, they're like DECA millionaires. If they're always interested in like, oh, you know, what's that life insurance thing you're talking about? Or what are you doing there? Or like, what is that little um, thing you're adding to your contract? There's some of like the most open-minded people. Even things like, why did we always eat bread and carb all the time? They question things. They have an open mind. I think that that's, um, that's something that I picked up as a success habit that I try to emulate. And it's just reinforced by a lot of unsuccessful people who exude the complete opposite habits. Absolutely. Let's shift gears again. You do real estate coaching. And the question I have is, why should someone get a coach? For the first part is, yeah, you can learn the stuff on your own. There's all the resources out there. You might have to do a little digging, but you never know what you don't know. And there's four stages of uh, consciousness or learning. You got the stage one, the unconscious uh, incompetent. That's the guy who doesn't even know what they don't know. And then you have conscious incompetence, the second stage, which is you know a little bit more and you know how much you suck. Like you, <laughs> you know how much... You don't know, but that's good. You're off on your way to getting to level four. Level three is the conscious competent. So you're able to do things. You're able to negotiate contracts to acquire real estate. You know who to use, yet you've got to be really, uh, you've got to talk to people. You know, this is, I think a mentor would be really key even in this, especially in this stage, because you know what you're doing and you're able to ask really good questions and to not make mistakes. And then of course, the last one is the unconscious competence where you know, you just know things. It comes unconsciously to you and you're able to teach things to other people. That's kind of my role is I'm sort of becoming into that fourth stage with a lot of the passive real estate investing. I don't claim to be a flipper or a rehabber. I f- strictly focus on passive real estate investing. I'm able to see things that people aren't able to see. You know, I, I tell the clients, CC me on all the emails because things pop up that nobody had a clue. The lender wouldn't have any clue. The broker wouldn't have any clue. The insurance guy or the client. And this is kind of the high oversight that I see, you know, like an example would be, I know a client is changing properties, you know, their primary residence, which will throw their debt to income ratio all out of whack. If I know that in the back of my head and I see these correspondences going back with the lender, I'd be like, hold up, let's not say that in an email. We need to start moving money from this bank account to this bank account three months in advance to season the cash reserves. Those are the kind of things that you'll never hear in a podcast, nor 
will you the world is moving so quick to you doing this for the first few times that you don't even know and so it's about making those kinds of mistakes saving the money to doing that and yeah i mean i can probably save someone a few thousand dollars in just the first acquisition has nothing to do with the deal flow or anything like that but just like on negotiating the process but the most important thing is always time i think that's the biggest thing that people don't even think about is like look at all the time you're screwing around and trying to learn this on your own and and most people don't even do it don't even take action that's why i pay for mentorship for apartment investing because number 1 like i said like i don't know what i don't know i don't want to make a big mistake on something huge like a 5 million dollar apartment i want to compress time you know time is the most important thing if i can get myself established now i get to reap those rewards for all the the years in the future as opposed to like burning it for the next 2 or 3 years and just those that time gets lost and then having that mentor also has skin in the game so i paid a big chunk of money i may not recommend that for flipping houses or wholesaling or even some passive investing but for me i was at a stage where life gets in the way you know steven pressfield those are some good books he writes about turning pro where he talks about resistance people get in life they just get stuck things get in the way they go to work and they don't have time to do any of this stuff but by me paying for mentorship i am in i am committed because i have financially committed myself to doing something i think a big component of the mentoring is the peer group peer group is just so important to round things out. Absolutely. And how do you know who is a good coach for you? First like the prerequisite ask yourself internally what do you want to do? What is your goal? Do you want to flip houses? Do you want passive cash flow? Like what do you want? Because I see a lot of people they you know they want passive cash flow but they're going to some flipping houses uh, seminar on the weekend and then they sign up for the $20,000 program and the $50,000 program. I'm like, dude, like what are you doing that for? That's not the path where you want to go. I'm not saying that they're a bad coach, but that's just not aligned with where you're heading. So I think that's the first step is to ask yourself the question and I don't think people ask themselves what their goals are enough. The next thing is find something who wants who who's doing it who's actively doing it and not just teaching it i don't claim to have a program where i talk in front of a video and i have all this stuff down because this not this stuff is just too you can't build a system robust enough to show every little thing a lot of it is one on one and individualistic you know you just can't get there you mentioned coaching styles and this is something i'm kind of working on i'm a little bit more of a challenging type of person something that motivates me is when people tell me i can't do something well i'm going to show you right i'm going to like prove it to you and that that's what something i kind of respond to whether it's in sports or real estate investing it fits my personality but for a lot of people that doesn't work for them or even makes them cry i think finding a coaching style that works and that's something i always ask like hey what what like works for you because i have the knowledge but i want to know what's the best messaging system for you rocky like what's the best the way to talk to you is it on the phone is it via text is it facebook message is it we chat is it line everybody's different you're the client you're the one who is going through the hard process of trying to absorb all this new information so i need to make it as easy as possible and i need to try and make it cater to your world because your life is hard enough as it is trying to learn all this stuff what is your opinion i know you work with a lot of different people and you're probably a lot better than this than i am <laughs> i think you have to and you're right so you have to know what you need coaching in you have to make sure that the coach is actually done the work and is not just a teacher meaning they've actually gone through the process so they know how to do it those inside secrets that 
you just know by doing it. You have to make sure that they're a good fit for you. The two of you have to be a fit. You have to trust your coach to take you through the process. So if you don't have trust and they're not working in your vibe length, then it's not a good fit. And you also have to make sure that they're the type of person who loves to give and teach and help you through the process. And they're not just doing it because it's a job for them and they want to make money. They should be dedicated to your success and they should have a a whole history of success with other people. And so you just have to go through and do your due diligence on the process. And you have to yeah. be ready for it. Coaching's expensive. And even though it's expensive, a good coach will tell you up front, my return on investment should be at least 10 times what you pay me. So you have to have a project that you can get a 10 times return on, and you have to have a coach who can provide you 10 times the return of what you're investing with them. The way I see it is I don't want a client that's, you know, I work with a certain subset of, of folks, you know, I, I like to find people who have families and if they were to just buy a few single family homes and now one of the spouses doesn't have to work, those are the people I like to work with. It doesn't really quite, quite get me thrilled when to work with some yuppie who computer programs and 22, 25, 27 years old and they have a lot of money. And, you know, I mean, that doesn't really thrill me. <laughs> To help folks like that. I'd rather make lasting change where I can, you know, change the face of a family for decades to come as opposed to just make a rich person richer. Part of what I get out of it too. Making a difference. Absolutely. So let's kind of shift gears again. And we've touched on this, but one of the other things that's out there is something called social capital. How would you define social capital to people? I think we think of like capital first as like money, right? Which makes sense. And we're all investors here. You have money. You know, I tell people that you make at least at least twelve percent to twenty five percent a year on your money. That's a, for a low risk investment like multifamily residential or single family residential. That's a good uh, return range you'll expect to see, but. I think when you invest in yourself, you know, I, I've heard of things like 10, 10 times that it kind of goes hand in hand with investing your social capital. And now not only are you investing in fruit that may come from just yourself, but you're investing in everybody in your network. It's interesting. I mean, it's just like working with, you know, there's certain people that you hit it off with. It just becomes, you know, synergetic. Instead of it, instead of being one plus one equals two, becomes one plus one equals eleven. There's just some people that you just bounce off ideas off of, and they they're good at this. They're good at optimizing Amazon um, sales, or this person's really good at SEO. Everybody's skill sets just comes hand in hand. This is kind of why I like multifamily real estate is because. It's such a big uh, job. You know, you need to have a people person. You need to have a technical person who's in the spreadsheets. You need the person talking to people, finding investors. I mean, just finding different people to complement your skill set is, is so important. And the social capital, it's, it's really neat how it's all about planting seeds. And I use this saying about people call me and, you know, they're well on their way you know, they don't have any rentals, but I can tell they've got the mindset. And that's one of the reasons I do the coaching is to kind of just have an excuse to talk to people because I know, you know, I'm new at this. I'm 31. I'm going to be probably in the game for the next 30 years, but it's, it, it's be interesting to climb the ladder together and see these people that I'm working with now, like to see them 30 years from now and where they're going in their own business and they're investing or whatever they're doing and what I'm doing and just kind of climb the ladder together and to see where we end up. I, I think that's really neat. And that's all goes hand in hand with the social capital aspect. Absolutely. It's, it's about helping other people and not expecting anything immediately in return or not even expecting anything in return. 
it's, you know, somebody calls up and says, hey, you know, I need a plumber. You share a plumber and you don't expect anything for doing that. You help other people get to where they're going. And eventually in time, if you're dealing with good people, they will help you when you have the need for something. And it goes back and forth. The more people you help, the more people who are going to be willing to help you over time. And so we need to build that social capital of helping people. Because as we talked about earlier with mentors, people do want to help other people. And when you help them first and you do those things, they're more willing to help you back. I talked about the four stages of consciousness. And honestly, I'm still probably in the conscious competence level, the third stage. Like I really have to be conscious about trying to build my social capital. I always have to have reminders about, oh, who did I haven't I haven't like linked Rocky up with somebody lately or or um sent an intro email to you know, link up a couple people or sent somebody some kind of article or some way to add value into somebody else's business in a while. And like I still have to consciously understand this stuff to make the effort and actually draw words into action and do it. It's all about the mindset. I kind of see the matrix. I see how it's all worked. I see how it's done poorly. You see people who have heard, the, oh, that Jim Rohn quote about, if you help enough people, then you'll get what you want. So then they see it as, oh, cool. I'm going to go around and just create a lot of these quid pro quo relationships. You and I can see that stuff coming from a mile away. And you just know when people are doing things on a more transactional basis, not out of the goodwill of their heart. I'll give you this property manager name, but um, you know who's the plumber you use there in Birmingham? A good book is, uh, I know the last name is Grant, Givers and Takers. Have you read that one, Rocky? I haven't read Givers and Takers. I've read Never Eat Alone and How to Make Friends and Influence People, which same kind of theme probably. Yeah. That's a short summary is, it's kind of what you said. There's two species of human beings, the podcast listeners and the non-podcast listeners. In this book, it says like, in life, they're givers or takers. Most people are takers. They just take, 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 take. And they may be, they may understand how, you know, you're supposed to appear like you're giving, but it, essentially in the deep down, they're just always takers. And the takers usually never, never go anywhere. They don't reach their potential. They don't have wealth, the wealth that they want because their mindset and their deep down persona is that they take. The people who give with reckless abandon and do it out of the goodness of their heart, those are the truly successful people. One of the tips that I've heard is, okay, we're supposed to go to these networking events, but the absolutely worst networking event is the untargeted one, like the, just a the random networking event, because you're in a room with all these takers. Everybody is in scarcity mode. Most people are looking for jobs. Most people are looking to pitch their product. Nobody's listening to each other. Nobody's authentically trying to build relationships. It's just a room of takers. And it took me a while to realize this. And it's like, you know, we're, we're told that everybody has worth and everybody has something to offer. And as givers, you and I should help everybody out. But to realize like, who are the people who are going to benefit the most people and who are the people that you want to have in your circle of influence or your five closest people or even your 50 closest people. I think you have to be conscious of who you have in your network. I always link people up via email, but I will never link up a taker with somebody in my network who's a giver. What What is your thoughts on that? Are takers always takers and givers always givers? I think so. You're just a giver and you give and you try with everyone and you plant seeds and you see, but if you have someone who's constantly taking and never giving, then you just stop planting over there and you go somewhere else. 
because you realize that's the type of person they are. But you just keep going out and you continually give and you help others. You help with no expectation of anything in return. But at the same point, there's that fine line between giving and helping and somebody who becomes one who's constantly taking without any thank you back or at least, and that's all you really need. I mean, at the end of the day, the simplest thing is just to say, thank you. You make an introduction for someone who's looking for a job and they get a job, just respond with an email saying, Hey, thank you. I got the job. I did it because of you. That's all you need to give back. And yet there are so many people who just won't do that simple little step of just saying, thank you. And then in the future, that person might send some information your way. That's kind of how that social capital world works. Yeah. And at first I felt kind of bad because I, like I said, you know, I always felt like I should give to everybody, but it's kind of like that thing. You can't teach people if they're unwilling to listen. I kind of see that the same way with takers, like you know, takers is always going to be a taker unless something happens. And, you know, I, honestly, I, I was probably a taker for the majority of my life, my upbringing and living in a scarcity mentality. It's a zero sum game is what I always thought. If I help you well, and your competitor, then, then you're going to take away something from me, or you're going to take properties away from me. And that's just not how the game works. And it took me a realization to change. So I'm not saying that everybody who is a taker is always going to be a taker and can't transition over like how I did, but it's a very low probability if I'm making, making sense. <laughs> and that's very possible. So we connected to talk about real estate. So let's kind of shift to the real purpose of today and get a little bit into real estate. So for most people, I think that the biggest question is, what is the best way for someone to get started in real estate? So the first thing I, you know, I always, I, I'm an engineer, so I always work in terms of flow charts. So the first question I ask is, okay, so if you were to imagine a triangle with three sides, the, the resources that we have are time, money, and then the third side is knowledge and slash network. So you need to self, do a self-reflection and say, okay, what do I have here? What, what am I working with? You know, because if you don't have anything, I'm sorry, my friend, like you, you need to work on getting at least one of those things freed up. Uh, so, I mean, a lot of people that I work with are short on time because they're, they're working professionals you know, they have some money. Um, and you know, they're, uh, they may not have the knowledge, but hey, if they they get a little coaching and they do a little um, research on their own, they can quickly get that. You know, it's not that hard. This real estate stuff isn't that hard. <laughs> but yeah, the first thing is to acknowledge what do you have and to move on from there. So self-assessment, know what you want and then know what you're looking to do in real estate and how it matches with your skill sets, whether you're going to be a flipper or a landlord or you're going to run uh, and, and have someone else manage everything for you and how it fits in with your skill set, the money you have, and the knowledge that you have. So what are some of the common mistakes that you see people make in real estate? I guess the first thing is just in the decision process, right? I mean, so you have a person who is short on time they have money. I mean, this is your typical working professional. And then they're flipping houses. It's like you just created another job. I mean, if you would have put a step in there, I mean, I would have asked the question, okay, what is your goal? You know, well, my family is so busy and, you know, I just want some, some money. And it's like, like, do you want cash flow or do you want money? Well, I, I, you know, I've got money already. I just need more cash flow so I don't have to work, keep trading my time for money. Like, okay, so why are you flipping houses? You know, like that the flipping houses is just the sexy thing you see on HGTV and when everybody gets into the frenzy about. 
It's the silent minority doing the buy and hold boring real estate that are silently killing it. And <laughs> you just don't see them. But it always comes down to like, what is your goals and what do you have to work with? I think that's the first thing. And it, it, it's always funny how people always, they just fall into the wrong thing because that just happened to be what was the seminar or the, what their buddy did or yeah, what they fell into. So let's talk about how to truly passively get involved with real estate. And I know in my real estate, I'm actively involved. However, my active level is rather small. I don't, I, I outsource a ton of things out. How do you, I know you manage properties at a long distance. How are you able to do that? All right. So I live in uh, Seattle and my properties are in Birmingham, Atlanta, Indianapolis. I hire professional property management. Um, you know, I, I go off of, again, my network and I find out who are the actual qualified people to do this. Um, I know a lot of people, they hear all the horror stories, but I think the thing that leads that up uh, to that is not going off referrals. I mean, to be a property manager, you need to have a real estate license for some strange reason. And unfortunately, most people go to the big brokerage houses like Century 21, Whitmere, Cobo Baker, and you're getting a ding dong who can't sell houses, managing your property management and working with your tenants. And that's just a recipe for disaster. And I think that's where a lot of these disaster stories come from. And um, I, yeah, so it's, it's about finding that property manager and getting the team and finding the right property. It's hard. Yeah. I mean, it's hard unless you have people in your network to help guide you and be informal mentors or to pay for a mentor. It's very difficult. But the other question is, you know, hey, you live like all this time, all this like distance away. Like, I don't, I don't really visit the property at all. In fact, I uh, like majority of them, 80% of my properties, I don't think I even, I've been to. I certainly didn't. Well, I've, I've been to a lot of mine because I go and look at properties for my folks, but um, uh, 80% of them I didn't look at. I didn't, I wasn't even in the state when I purchased the property doing the due diligence. So it's all about managing, effectively managing the teams like the property inspector from remotely and keeping people accountable. I mean, everybody has jobs and you need to pay them a professional wage to do what you need them to do. And I think when you start to cheap out on things, that's where you start to get in trouble. And, you know, just like, you know, I'm going to cheap out and just read all these free PDFs or I'm going to cheap out and try and manage it myself. I, I, I think that's where you get into trouble a lot. Absolutely. And I think so. If you pay for quality, you get quality. And it sounds like you've built a team and you've built social capital to have the network to be able to do this. And I think that's the biggest thing I, I, when I talk to people and they say, Oh, I want to get involved in real estate. One of the biggest things that I notice is they have no team. And it's like, well, when something goes wrong, who are you going to call to handle that problem? Because if you're going to do it yourself, you're back to trading time for money. And if you're not a good plumber, you might create a bigger mess than you really want to do all to save 10 bucks. Uh, you know, actually not say save, you know, a hundred bucks for getting a plumber and you end up with a $5,000 problem down the road. So it's, I think building a good team. And having trust in your team is a good, very good first step in building up that network so that when you go in and you make the decision, you have all the people in place to do these things. The other issue that comes up is in order to have a good team, it comes at a cost. How do you figure out deals that allow you the margin to be able to do this because when I run numbers, uh, more often than not, the deals are not good enough to pay for the team. Yeah. So a lot of the markets that we like to buy in are secondary markets. And I talk about 
primary, secondary, and tertiary markets on the podcast. But the primary markets are, you know, all the cool places to live like Seattle, um, Dallas, Los Angeles, New York. I mean, a lot of those places, the rent to value ratios don't make sense. And maybe I should define it. The rent to value ratio is the monthly rent divided by the purchase price. So a $100,000 home that rents for $1,000, do the math, like $1,000 divided by $100,000 is 1%. So that's kind of a key threshold right there where a lot of real estate investors like to use as a quick and dirty way of seeing will this cash flow. In Seattle, you'll buy $400,000 homes that will rent for a little over $1,000. And you're looking at rent to value ratios of a half a percent. So, and that's pretty indicative of what you'll find in these primary markets. So we like to go to the secondary markets because the primary markets just don't have the rent to value ratios. I think that's caused by just a lot of unsophisticated money in those areas. People who don't listen to podcasts that just want to have rental properties bidding the properties up and just just pure speculation in those high-priced areas. Too much money. <laughs> you know, you find these secondary markets that you know are a little bit off the beaten path, but they're good areas. And these secondary markets are large cities, multi-million population cities. Some of them are like Memphis, Atlanta, Indianapolis, Kansas City, Birmingham. These are blue collared cities. The other criteria is that you need to have a robust economy here because at the end of the day, that's the driver for all this stuff. It's where are the blue collar people working? What's the backbone of this economy? That's a good example of like Detroit. Detroit's a secondary market, but it didn't really have a robust economy. I mean, it just had one, it just had the car industry. And that's why that wouldn't really fit the criteria of a secondary market that has a robust economy. While we're on the subject, you have the tertiary markets, which is the next tier over. And this is a lot like, um, if you guys are familiar with Washington, you know, you have a Yakima, Washington, or a, I guess if you're down in California, maybe like a Fresno, California down there. Or like in Texas, like a Waco, Texas. Those are examples of smaller towns. And it's hard in those cities because it's such a small sample size. It's, it's very ebb and flow. There's really not a, usually a robust economy. It's usually based on one entity, like a college or just one employer. And it's just really not a good stable place to build your your portfolio from. Today, I see a lot of people trying to sell houses out of their tertiary markets. And the numbers work on them work today because we're in a good, you know, seller's market today. Things are going well. But I think at the first sign of problems, you're going to see these tertiary markets go offline because they just don't have that robust economy. That's the first level. Does that make sense? Directly. It makes perfect sense. And I just had a massive thought pop in my head because I just coached somebody who is living out in Seattle. And we talked about buying a house. And I actually asked that question. And he, he was buying it to live in himself. It makes perfect sense for somebody in Seattle to rent a $400,000 house for $1,000 a month and buy a rental property in a good tertiary market cash flows to pay his rent in Seattle so he can live for free. Exactly. That's what I do. I rent. I think if you live in a primary market where the rent to value ratios are less than I'd say 0.8%, I don't know why people buy houses. I think it's again, just like the dogma with the stock market to invest your 401k, it's the dogma to buy a home. Kind of getting a little side topic, but if you're to buy a home, a $600,000 home here in Seattle, you're going to need $120,000 of capital to use as a down payment. Yeah, you say that there's all these FHA low uh, down payment, but you're getting killed with the interest rate and PMI. 
buying that property and putting down $120,000, you probably could have bought one, two, three, four, four or five turnkey rentals, each cash flowing at $300 a piece. So that's $1,200. And that's cash flow alone. That's not even including any of the mortgage pay down, the uh, tax benefits, and the uh, inflation hedge for getting a larger loan. And I, I talk about, I have this video where I talk about the four ways you make money on my uh, website. You guys can check out on that for the math behind it. But effectively, at the end of the day, you're probably making $4,500 on total return with the cash flow being just 1200 of that. And that's the way you need to look at it. What's the total return? What's the opportunity cost by not investing? That's just on the down payment. And then you add injury to insult. And now this family who bought this home to live in, now they're strapped down with this $4,000 mortgage payment. And I think that's why cash flow is one of the three words in my, my uh, website. Cash flow is so important. Cash flow is a lifeline to any financial situation or any financial family situation. Once you lose that cash flow, you have run out of options. You're living paycheck to paycheck and you cannot even invest to get yourself out of the hole. By renting, you're paying less at the end of the day and you still have the freedom to uh, move where you want in case your job changes. It gives you the freedom to live your life the way you want to because things change all the time. And also a strange byproduct is people always say, you know, I have a family, we can't move. Um, I get that. People want to have a sense of home. I'll argue back and forth with them saying that that's a false sense of security. Then I say, Hey, try this out with your spouse. Now, when you're renting, because the, rent to value ratios are lopsided in your favor. That landlord subsidizing your house because the investor skew is so backwards in where you're living that you can, for that same $4,000 rent, now you're living in a place that's like a $1.2 million house. So you just upgraded from your $600,000 home to something that's almost double. I'll let your, your spouse take a look at that and Ask the question again, what do you rather have? <laughs> this is really cool because you're looking at an issue and all of a sudden we're changing the lenses of how we look at things and looking at it from different points, the same situation from different points of view. It totally changes the mindset of how you should do these types of things. I don't think anyone. And I haven't seen anything written about doing what we just talked about. I've gotten this question a bit of people who live in high cost of area living, and they're all thinking, oh, we should buy a place, we should buy a place. And yet the reality is, is what we've just looked at is if you're looking in an area that's got high property values and low rents, it is so much smarter to rent and not buy that house. That's so against popular culture and thinking. I gave you the long-winded answer there. I mean, here's the engineer way of explaining it, which is the, uh, you know, I don't need all the stories. I just show me the numbers. Look, when you're investing in cash flowing assets that maybe aren't appreciating, but at the end of the day, their total return is around the 30% plus or minus a little bit. But when you are purchasing your home, you're barely keeping up with the rate of inflation. You're like at single di low single digits. And it's clear as day. What would you rather have, 30% or, I don't know, 5%? The delta is 25%. That's why people have to you know, work 30 years to pay for their primary residence. If you and I were like the government, I mean, it's almost like they engineered this to happen. <laughs> they socially engineered this. In a sense, it makes you trapped. It makes you have to work. It makes you have to go and do things. And when you don't own the house, you don't have to worry about repairing the refrigerator and the roof. Someone else takes care of that bill for you. 
you've actually reduced your risk by renting. And I did a podcast talking about this concept, and I started off with the cell phone. Now, we're all on board about like leasing the cell phone instead of buying it all right. We all have socially accepted that, I think. I was looking to get a new computer, and then Apple's got this cool business financing thing. And, you know, that makes sense. Take it a next step further and leasing my car. Leasing your car makes so much sense. <laughs> well, I don't know that I'd go that far. I guess it really depends on the situation. The problem with leasing a car is that you're always going to be in a payment. Whereas if you buy a car, at some point you're out of a payment. Right. Let me rephrase my argument. There's a paradigm shift here. If you're a person who is able to invest in something like myself, I'm able to turn things at 20% plus a year. So for me, it makes total sense. And if you're flipping houses or doing some kind of active activity or have a business on the side, it makes total sense that you want to have as much cash in your pocket and not to put it down on a down payment or to purchase a car. Put your money to highest and best use, right? We, it always comes down to highest and best use. And that's fine. So you better have a highest and best use, not that you're just leasing the car because you want it and right. there's no other income coming in anywhere else. So if if you're creating other income, that's great. And then the highest and best use is to put the lease in the company name. Right. So I guess my, my advice is a little irresponsible because I failed to realize that the majority of Americans are unable to save a single penny. It's not because they don't make enough money, but they're just don't have the financial skills, stay on a budget and spend appropriately. So for the majority of Americans, say like 80% of folks out there, it's probably better to purchase your home or to buy a car because that's a four savings account. And that's the best you will get. Well, yes. So I would hearken that to what they talk about in the insurance industry is, should I buy a whole life policy or should I buy a term policy? And the common wisdom is, buy the term, invest the difference. So with a home, I would say, if you're in one of those markets that's really high cost, rent the home, invest the difference. Don't just go blow it. Or don't then just go, instead of, if you're going to spend $4,000 a month to buy a home, don't go rent the $4,000 home that's four times bigger, rent the $1,000 home, take your $3,000 and go save it and invest it. And if real estate's for you, great. If the stock market's great for you, great. If there's some other business that works for you, fine. But create that margin and that difference and save that difference to build wealth. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much you make, it's how much you keep. And unfortunately, most people don't keep anything. Right, right. And it, it has nothing to do with interest rates. It's all a matter of like, what's the return on investments? What's the delta between what are you making and what are you spending? Absolutely. So as we start to wrap up here, is there anything else that you would like to share? No, I think the whole reason I created Simple Passive Cash Flow is like, you know, I'm just a regular guy. You know, I work, I still work my engineering job. I think most of my time is just doing the podcast. I do apartment investing these days. It's pretty simple to build passive cash flow. And that's the tagline of the show. Simple passive cash flow is it's simple to build passive cash flow, but it, the hard part is like, what do you do after that? Like, what's like, what do you do? Like trying to figure out what you're going to do with your time and money after that, after you've created this, this thing that just goes off on its own. Like that's the hard part. You've got to find out what you enjoy doing and go do what you enjoy. For me, I have kids and I want to spend a ton of time with them, enjoying them as they grow up. You only get so many years there. So I go spend time with them. Now, in a couple of years, they're going to go to college. So I'm going to figure out something new to do with my time that makes me happy and that's enjoyable for me. Right. Yeah. I, you know, I like doing the podcast, like helping people. And I've always, I probably should have been a teacher 
going through school, but I didn't make any money, <laughs> so I didn't do that. It kind of helps me fulfill that that passion side to do that. And I guess what I like is I'm starting to see some of it come back. People have bought these homes. Now they're often doing it on their own. It totally changes a destiny of a family. You know, now instead of somebody working 30 years, 40 years as at a job, their you know, their time has come in compressed and hey, now I only gotta work till I'm like 42 now because I just started it. It all starts there. And I like to hear your input on this, Rocky. It always comes down to, okay, cool. You have all this information. You might even pay for mentoring and you have somebody holding your hand on the path. We're going to pick up that first rental. But then there are always these, oh, maybe I shouldn't. You know, I'm, I, I have a pretty comfortable life. I'm fine. I'm fine working, you know, I guess. But then I always ask the question and I, I kind of ask it in my challenging way, like, okay, cool. Like, if you don't want to do this, that's something unsure and a little different and a little scary for you. You know with certainty what you're going to get if you keep doing what you're doing, if you keep investing in the stock market, if you keep, you know, living in your purchase home and, you know, not making sacrifices, you know what's going to happen. You're going to end up like everybody else who, is sort of like drones at work who just goes in because they have to pay for their mortgage, they have to pay for their kids' college education. You can be like everybody else who doesn't have any time to do what they want to do, that's commuting to work every single day, you know what's going to happen. So I'm like, okay, there it is. You make the decision, but just make the decision consciously that you didn't get stuck with this life. You chose it. Absolutely. We all make those choices. And you have to be intentional and purposeful with the choice that you want to make. That's what you literally have to do. Say, where am I going? How am I going to get there? And who's going to help me on this journey? And make sure you pick the right choice. If you find that you're going in a certain direction and you realize along the way that it's not where you want to be, then pivot and go make a new choice. We're going to fail throughout life. We're going to screw up. We're going to make mistakes. It's not that it isn't going to happen. It's when it happens, you just shake it off and say, lesson learned, time to go a new direction. And there's always an excuse why not to do something. People like to say, well, you know, Lane said that it's a seller's market right now and the stock evaluations are so high and and 9-11 will happen. Oh, the Trump election, I'm going to wait after the election or I'm going to wait after the Cold War or whatever. Like there's always an excuse not to do it. But the best time to like plant a tree was what, 30 years ago, right? And the next best time is today. I will make a comment on that. It comes down to valuations. If today isn't a good day to buy real estate, today is a good day to learn how to buy real estate. Today is a good day to learn how to build a team. Today is a good day to do everything else so that when the valuations flip or when the opportunity presents itself and when the opportunity comes up, you are ready to move immediately. And I don't advise going out and making an investment when the valuations are bad, but that doesn't mean you can't prepare, you can't be ready, you can't have everything in place to be able to go, because when the opportunity comes knocking, you should be ready to just go. Right. I haven't bought anything in quite a while. I've analyzed 400 multifamily unit apartments. Now, that takes me 15 minutes to analyze each deal and just nothing is working. <laughs> I'm just not buying anything right now. We mentioned it before. Another action item is like working that social capital because that's, uh, that's the, one of the biggest levers you have. Building the team around you, building relationships with people on the same path as you so you guys can climb the, the ladder together. 
Absolutely. Lane, it's been great chatting with you today. People can find you at Simple Passive Cash Flow, and I encourage them to check you out and learn more about real estate if that is something that they are interested in getting involved with. Thanks for being here today. Thanks, Rocky. We explored quite a bit on mindsets and habits of success with Lane today. It's not easy to create a real estate business, and it does take a lot of work. However, the rewards are there, and when it's done properly, you can have tremendous success. Thanks for listening.